Tassa, Namo Tassa, Bagoato, Arahato, Sama, Samudasa, Namo Tassa, Bagoato, Arahato, Sama, Samudasa. Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Yeah, it's hard to know exactly where to start, but I think what we need to do is have a couple classes uh, on this. And I, I think people really need to understand what the capsule was. And I'll show you what I mean. Let me see if I can um, do this real quick. If I can, we'll get one if I can. Let me see if I can, let me try. Um, hold on, I do that. Okay, here we go. Hold on. Okay, it involved a few pages and so let me go back to you now and pull up the, I will pull up the, um, I will, the share screen and we're, we should be in good shape here. We have a, there you go. Now, I want to tell you the thing about the thing about when I'm when I'm teaching you about this uh, to keep in mind is this is not me saying this is going to work. This is Bon TV Miller Ramsey and me for a long time. We were working for years, like 10 to 15 years. OK, attempting to encapsulate what precisely is working with students to help them to understand the TWIM, the practice itself but to get to path and pass down path and experience cessation. This is, this is what this was about. And, um, you know, Bhante's not somebody who's expressly fond of Abhidhamma and thinks it's pretty complicated at times and unnecessary for people to get involved with too much information because then all you do is you sit there and we can watch the person try to piece it together and see what's happening now and where does it fit in the Abhidhamma puzzle so that we were curious of exactly what do you need and what I was doing for years was attempting to listen very carefully to how Bhante's teaching and why it is successful how is it working so look at what came out of this and you can see on these pages that I'm going to show you and I can if I get some people that are interested in this we can go into it more deeply but there's only like about three pages involved in this in the training capsule fundamental section of the workbook that we used to give out for the retreats and you have to have the right definitions for the primary words involved in teaching TWIM that's the first thing when people come to you and they want to experience the tranquil wisdom insight meditation, there are some of the primary definitions that are different from what people are talking about in the world, what you've been exposed to or you heard of before. So what we want you to do is when you come, come at least with one pane of the window in your mind is open and you will are willing to come through this pain and look at TWIM as an individual practice and try to come with the idea that you're going to experience this practice by itself to see what it is and how it works. That's one of the biggest secrets to this thing. If you want to make it move smoothly and you want to come to it and you want to succeed within 10 days, to go through and uh, stabilize yourself with the Samatha experience, start to experience the, um, the levels of cessation, which are moving down, 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 reducing out the Atta more and more and more towards as you move towards 
the point of the eighth jhana where you're going to fall into cessation. But you have to understand the pieces of this, how it works. And you can't have these pieces just as individual things that study you study without saying, for instance, maybe the concept of this whole thing, there's the concept of the automobile and all the parts that make up the automobile, but the automobile is a concept and then there's pieces, okay? Let's say TWIM is a, the Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation is a concept. And let's say, what are the pieces that make that up? And so the first one we run into is mindfulness and mindfulness in TWIM is different than the mindfulness that has been developed in the mindfulness movement, for instance, worldwide. That, you have to remember, is a secular, separated off kind of mindfulness not having to do with Buddhist practice in, as, as, that worked, the Buddhist practice that worked and helped you to get to path and move down. So what was the Buddha doing? The Buddha... The Buddha was actually examining um, in his meditation the steps of the Four Noble Truths as the path for his investigation. So he's trying to look at the suffering that he saw in the world when he went out of the palace and understand what is this suffering? How, what is the suffering first? Pinpoint it. If you want to see how well he broke this down, you go to Majima Nikai number 141 and go through that, that sutta. And when you go through that sutta, you're going to see very clearly. I'm looking around for the book. Okay. Uh, you're going to look, you're going to see very clearly how there is a paragraph broken down for every single part of what he talks about being suffering. So he was very, very systematic in his training, you know, by the time he was finished. And when we look in 141, we hear the stock phrase, we always hear of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. That comes right after there is suffering, there is cause, there is cessation, and there is, a, then there's path to the cessation of suffering. But before you go into the path to look at what it is, you really need to know what was the suffering he's talking about. And did he actually describe the suffering for you? It's called the Exposition of the Truths, 141. And you see, first he explains to you the four truths. And then he goes and he explains for you um, the, the, the um, noble truth of suffering. He says, what is the suffering is there because of birth. And then he tells you what birth is. He tells you what aging is. He tells you what death is. He tells you then what sorrow is, what lamentation is, what um, bodily uh, pain is, and what mental pain is. That sorrow, lamentation, pain is the body of pain and grief. He goes into that is the mental pain, despair. So that stock phrase of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair becomes pretty important because he breaks it all down, okay? And then he goes into a little bit deeper explaining um, one thing that we have to switch over to understanding aggregates by themselves are not suffering. People get caught up in this and they think the aggregates themselves just existing is suffering, okay? But the aggregates are only suffering when affected or if affected by clinging. And so sometimes you see it, aggregates are so, aggregates of suffering, but what that means is aggregates are suffering if you are craving and clinging to those aggregates. So that's you have to learn these things. If you think the aggregates by themselves are suffering, the fact that you exist and have the aggregates, period, have to be suffering, you got a lot of suffering to come in life, okay? Um, so look at this on the on the page here. We had to take mindfulness and say exactly what mindfulness is going to be in this practice, in this training. So mindfulness is the actual observation skill that you learn to use when you are training with the tranquil wisdom inside meditation. Mindfulness has some special qualities. This observation skill 
remembers, and the question is, what does it remember? It remembers what we need to do whenever distractions um, arise. And some of this needs to be rewritten because distractions, as we know now very clearly, they do not pull us away. We actually, some things change in our practice so that our attention moves away. So we cannot, uh, I tell people sometimes, actually, the hindrances are innocent. <laughs> They're innocent. And they look at me funny if they've been having problems with hindrances, but the hindrances are totally innocent. Once you understand through training with us how a hindrance works, what gives it the energy and or the food it needs in order to cause problems and how the problem actually occurs, you begin to understand it's because the elements of my practice are slipping down that the attention moves over to the hindrance. You see, and that is not the hindrance's fault, okay? But if we don't understand what a hindrance is, how that arises, what is the nutriment for a hindrance, what happens if we feed the hindrance, what happens if we don't feed the hindrance in relationship to the other things we need in our practice in order to get to cessation? Well, then we don't get successful, we don't. So we learn to watch how distractions operate and when our attention moves off an object, mindfulness reminds us to do all six steps or five of the active steps, you know, of the six R's. I say that because to recognize you not on your object anymore, to release, let go of the unwholesome, place you are and relax your head and smile and come back. And another way to look at this is to train your mind to never mind any distraction because distractions teach us how craving actually happens, but the content of a distraction is empty for us. We, it has no information, no matter what it is, it has no information for us that is gonna take us to be enlightenment or waking up. So we learn to watch how the distractions operate and when a an attention moves off the object, mindfulness reminds us to do all six of the steps in the practice cycle, remember them by heart, reminds us to just never mind these distractions, let them go, relax the tension and tightness in your head continually as we, you re-smile and come back to continue your practice. That's the whole thing. And then repeat that only as needed. Why do I stress that? Because some people think that, wow, you know, all these thoughts are up here around my head happening the whole time I'm practicing. Shouldn't I keep doing, 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 doing this? And the hallmark or the cue for you to do the six hours is only if you move the attention away, you need to never mind what it is, let it go, relax, smile, and come back. That's what you need to do. Let it go, relax, smile, and come back. And keep smiling and keep going with whatever place you are working in your meditation. That's what you're training your mind to do. And the way you train the mind to do it is by doing it over and over and over again until mind goes into an automatic state. So the moment we notice the craving and clinging begin to happen, the moment we feel the change in the tension in our mind, it, that's what we need to say, let this go, never mind. Re never mind, let it go, relax, smile, and come back. That's what people are grabbing onto here now and really doing well with, okay? Uh, the cycle completes right effort. And right effort in the text has four pieces, four steps. So you are you you're got the background on it straight in your mind. If you're teaching, you need to explain. There's two sets of two. So the first two pieces are recognizing the unwholesome mind state. You're not on your object anymore. And then the second part is releasing and relaxing the head. 
that's purifying the mind, isn't it? And then the last two down here, if you don't do those two, you'll have to keep doing these two until the day you die because nothing will change in your mind and it'll keep coming back. The second part of the right effort was you recognize it, you release it and relax your head. Then you bring up a wholesome and you keep that wholesome going and come back to your object of meditation and you keep anything in your mind that resembles what that felt like in that wholesome state. You see, that's okay to have in your mind. Okay, and, and you are working with your object with that wholesome, that's the most wholesome thing that you can do. But the smile is an immediate way to cancel the unwholesome in your mind and have a wholesome in your mind. You got to bring up the wholesome, keep it going, and create more wholesomes and continue wholesome states the whole time you're practicing. The second part is Buddhist meditation. What is the Buddhist meditation? We need to know this in reference to TWIM, not in reference to any other kinds of yoga or anything else anywhere, just in reference to the tranquil wisdom insight meditation. When you're learning it, just try to understand what Buddhist meditation was in that respect. The meditation itself was an effort to see clearly the true nature of everything. Now, it is the way to see and understand how suffering works. The simple fact is that no one can let go of suffering until they know what it is and how it operates. Just letting go of the Attention without and doing anything else and coming back and immediately and keep going, no progress, no path. So this is how we he saw the Buddha saw the symptoms of arising suffering first. The meditation is becomes the, the instrument for the observation. The mindfulness is the observation. And the mindfulness has this memory thing in it, and it remembers whenever something is getting tight in your mind. You should run those six steps. Then it says, and now I'm going to recollect for you that there are six steps and do all six of them. And then it says, and don't forget if anything else comes up, do it the same way. So this are the little memory pieces that are in the, the, the observation skill. But the purpose of the meditation, why are you doing it? This is how he saw the symptoms of the arising suffering first. Meditation is your instrument for the observation. If, and if the Buddhist suttas, in the Buddhist suttas, he explains to his monks how he observed his own human body and his mind, and, and mind, the body and mind. And the Buddha recounted to the monks how Venerable Sariputta saw one by one how each level of cessation occurred in the Anupada Sutta. So we teach you the Anupada Sutta for a particular reason. We teach it because it has the full account of how each level contained pieces, and then some of those would leave and others would come in and be in the next level. And it would be a consistent downward, deeper, deeper, deeper practice down to the bottom step of the staircase. That one is that mentioned in 107. He's teaching you a gradual teaching with gradual practice, with gradual progress. He wants you to be methodical. He wants you to understand the part of it, how it actually is working. That's what he wants you to do. Okay. And, he, and all he had, if you want to think about what he had to teach, my goodness, he could have told you about a lot of things, but he was he made the decision to teach you and perfect a way of teaching you what actually happened to him in his experience as he got to path went down and went through he doesn't spend a lot of suttas talking about all the other things he does there's only maybe two suttas in majima nikaya i think that talk about the strenuous things that he did before he found out it was a lot easier to do this if you just follow these instructions. But once he starts to teach them, the solution is always the same. It has to do with, he tells you in 148, 
in order to get to Nibbana, you must be able to see and understand the origination, how the, uh, the suffering arises, how it passes away, okay? How you get personally involved in it, which is called gratification. And then the danger of that gratification, which is, the danger is if you get involved with the distractions and things, you fall off the path and you have to climb back up on track and keep going again every single time. So he's telling you how to handle that. And then in the end of that statement in the Chichaka Sutta says the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger and the escape. That's a nutshell version of what he t- he's saying. And I found the escape. Hello, it's the pinky on the finger. <laughs> okay, I did find the escape. That's where I get excited because he says right there, I did find the escape. Okay. In another sutta, he says, I did find the antidote. You know, that's another place where he tells you, uh, I do not teach a, uh, I do not teach you something that it does not have a basis. I do not teach you without knowledge, clear knowledge. And then I do not, um, teach you something that is antidotal, like there's no antidote. I teach you something with a clear basis. And that basis was his personal experience. That basis was the Buddha's personal experience, how he went through. And that's what he decides to teach after he's enlightened. He has to walk from where he is to Sawati. And on going down there before he talks to the five aesthetics, he thinking in his mind, how am I going to do this? How am I going to present this? How am I going to uh, do it? And he realizes that he's going to teach them what happened uh, to me precisely, how I got there and how it worked. And that's what he decides to teach. And that's what he hands down to us. And that's where the whole core of this comes from. Now, the, the longer... The longer you sit, the deeper you understand what the suffering is and the faster you will let go of it and relax your head, which is the home of mind in this in this teaching. Whether it is or not, I don't want to discuss it. They're still hunting for it. Maybe they'll find it one day. <laughs> you know, but the answers that you've been searching for concerning upsetting emotional states that are brought on by stress, anxiety, frustration, anger, depression, withdrawal away from other people, all those things. All of these are revealed to us one by one as they occur in your own sessions of discovery and during events occurring in life when you're applying the practice. That is what's true here. So over the last 20 years, it was observed that a student needs a minimum foundation knowledge of the Buddha Dhamma to support the proper development of their practice and gain the ability to experience the higher attainments by going down through a course of levels of cessation to fall into total cessation, come out with what is sort of like a newborn brain. Um, And when I teach uh, dependent origination, I looked back, uh, and when I was teaching dependent origination in 2012 in, in one of the colleges in Sri Lanka, and when I was presenting it, before I would teach you dependent origination, I would teach you the lesson of the Bhadarakata Sutta. I would teach you about reviewing your understanding, sharpening your understanding of what past really means and what future means and what the present time is. And then I would teach you the dependent origination. Why would I do that? Why why do we do that? We do that because you need a clear understanding about uh, the past. It makes it easier for you to let it go if you understand the energy of those events in the past are done and used up. And in the future, uh, in the future, There is no energy in those things yet. So if you put any worry toward the future or thinking constantly about the past, when you're sitting in the present time, you know, we have this little thing we say is the car. While you're in this, 
in the present time, if you're doing that, you're sucking the energy to do it out of this present time container or this little car. And the little car can go along like this through life and it it's runs fine and it'll help you get through all of your life. But if you leave the trunk open and put the things that happen along the way in the trunk, it's going to wobble and fall off track. So we have to review what are we actually keeping in our mind that is preventing us from reaching path and and going down path and experiencing it, you know fairly easily going through those levels and do we actually have to go to one level and stay there for a few years and perfect it before we go to another level there's a lot of things that have happened in many 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 different trainings in the world now that isn't reflected in the texts any place. It's reflected that um, these levels, once you, you can meet and greet one, you can meet and greet the next and the next and the next and the next and go down. You see, we have so much that has slipped out of alignment in understanding. What am I talking about? Mm. Uh, reaching Nibbana, experiencing Nibbana. Are we going someplace? Are we reaching something? Or are we just is it just an experience of opening the mind? A degree of opening the mind appears to be what this is the first time you experience it. Ah, she said the first time. She thinks that you're looking at me and saying she thinks there's more than one Nibbana. Well, the fact is there are suttas that end like this. A monk comes and asks Ananda or, or Sariputta, how long does this take, friend? And they turn to the person and say, not long, not long. And when Sariputta said that, he had taken two weeks to get to Arahatsha. So that means a lot, that you can go down through here and experiencing the attainment, then the attainment, fruition, attainment, attainment, fruition. He, the Buddha had explained all of that but we don't talk about this much because it wasn't brought out in some of the commentarial things that are considered more important than the texts are sometimes and that's the problem we don't go back systematically in buddhism it isn't universal among all of these schools and traditions that when we are teaching something we should be reflecting beside reflecting on whether it matches what this was said by the Buddha for a line of teaching. And that's where TWIM is a little different because we're not supposed to be teaching outside the framework of the suttas, try to stay as close as possible to what there, whether there was an actual cake mix that said, you know, we're making this cake, it has six ingredients, and it has these specific blending instructions do not blend it any other way that's what's that's what happened we lost we got off track and somehow at some point when attainments disappear then the whole system suffers because we have to find a way for uh, for survival and that had a lot of influence on what happened across the timeline so many, many things changed and fell in different directions. So what we're trying to do is show you something. Bhante found something. <laughs> he went to Thailand, went in the cave with the, uh, with the Majima Nikaya, dedicated himself to reading the book through a, a few times all the way through and following it precisely, figuring out which ones of those suttas actually fed your meditation and helped you and which ones didn't so much. They were valuable in different ways. And this is what was going on. So it's a nice way to end the year this year to just go through and talk about all of this. Now, look at this next part. Over the 20 years, it was observed that students need a minimum foundation knowledge to support the development of their practice and gain the ability to experience these higher attainments. So the answer is across the past 20 years, we kept track of the most successful meditators that we had by watching exactly what did they know in order to get through. They didn't just come sit down and meditate. And then just we worked with their meditation and that was it. 
we were reading to them directly from the suttas that were the specific ones that were giving them the information they needed in order to run this little car, you know, through the through the path the right way and have it go very smoothly. So there's the reason it's working is because you are simultaneously learning the meditation and comprehending the Dhamma side by side. Without that, you will not have the success as a teacher. You will not have a success in helping your students go from like 30 minutes when they start to three, four, five hours at the end of 10 days. That sounds ridiculous, but that's what's happening. So why I'm trying to see clearly how, why is that happening? They are simultaneously learning the meditation and comprehending the Dhamma. At the end of this retreat, one of them, when I was resting, after lunch, went up on the board, erased a bunch of stuff and put everything he had learned from the beginning of the retreat to the sixth day. He did that. I was impressed, you know, <laughs> he was, you know, I've been at larger retreats where uh, people show me their notes in their interviews and I'm impressed that they were going so precisely with what I was teaching, but that's what it takes precisely. And don't go outside the lines. And don't throw in this because it used to work with that or this because it used to work with that. Because when you're baking a cake, it doesn't work if you change the recipe for the kind of oil you were using or you use a different ingredient that is a substitute for what they said. Sometimes recipes are very, very specific in order for them to work. And this is one of those recipes. Now, they're simultaneously learning the meditation and comprehending the Dhamma. It's the parallel training the Buddha used to measure the progress of his early monks in the beginning is echoed. What I'm saying is echoed at Diga Nikaya number 28, section 10. You will find something that is called the story about the modes of progress. And the modes of progress were four areas of knowledge that support your development the very best it can. And this allows you to reach the highest levels of attainment in a very reasonable length of time. So how, these modes of progress uh, came, I'll tell you what it was. The Buddha was speaking to uh, Ananda and Ananda just says, you know, the monks think you're a marvelous teacher. And he says to Ananda, what do they mean a marvelous teacher? And then he starts to talk about what is marvelous about the Buddhist teaching with his monks. And one of the first things that is mentioned is the modes of progress. You gave us the modes of progress. That makes him a marvelous teacher. What did he tell those monks? He told the monks that if you have a painful meditation and slow comprehension of the Dhamma, that was poor progress. If you have a painful meditation and clear comprehension of the Dhamma, that is poor progress. That shot a hole in a lot of things we hear about nowadays of struggle to go through your pain, okay? Without, you have to have proper knowledge of pain. You have to be told in the beginning of your practice uh, that's one of the tools you need to know when you go into meditation about pain, about mental pain and about physical pain and about meditation pain and pain that can actually hurt your body. And you need to understand these things. Once you understand these things, you would begin to understand that even if you had excellent meditation or, you know, uh, comfortable meditation with uh, slow comprehension of the Dhamma, you were still poor progress. See how it has to be a parallel teaching for you to be doing what the Buddha was teaching with his monks. Your progress has to go, you have to have a uh, comfortable meditation operation with clear comprehension of the Dhamma. That's the key to the thing. So that's why we know for sure that he was using a method that was not just what you can physically do with your body in meditation. He was teaching the Dhamma hooked into the meditation, a parallel teaching. 
So this lets them know how they're prog progressing if he's gone and they look at this, they can say, I am making progress because I'm having more comfort and I'm sitting for longer periods of observation. And I do have a very clear understanding of this Dhamma, then you're going to, you're going to get there. So we know these four areas of knowledge and, um, this allows you to reach the highest levels of attainment in a reasonable length of time. That's how they did it. So there's four pieces of the, of the Dhamma you really need to be aware of. And the first one is the Four Noble Truths. The, the first one in the Four Noble Truths, um, in a sense that they sum up the Buddhism, uh, what it's all about. That's one way we look at it. And we've heard them presented as four open-ended statements inviting Siddhartha to go on a quest to find the answers about human suffering. So these were statements, and they, but they were open-ended. I'm going to stress that really hard because when we change those uh, statements, and they're not open-ended, so what do I mean? Then, well, that, then you can't progress. So let's just take the first one. I'm not going to go into all four of these here, but if I say to you, there is suffering in life, there is suffering in life. That is the open-ended statement, because now you're going to want to go and find out what the suffering was. It was invitational. It was a statement, but it was an invitational open-ended statement, and Siddhartha pursued a search to figure out what the suffering actually was, okay? Uh, a way to change that so it's not so good is if I say to you, all life is suffering. Is that the same statement? That is not the same statement. Now, if you have English as a second language, you might think that that's saying the same thing. And that's what I believe has happened. That's what I think is going on. But uh, it's a real sad thing because the English speakers who look at that or anyone who understands English properly understands that that is an absolute statement. And there's no point in anybody going to contest a fact that is in a statement like that. There's not, nowhere for you to go. The second one was there is a, a, a cause of suffering. That was very plain. There is a cause of suffering. Okay. And um, that allows you to go search and see what the cause is for yourself and discover what's going on. And what happened is in modern booklets now, modern writing, you're going to find another statement for that one. You're going to see sometimes people will say the cause of suffering is desire. Now, this one's tricky. <laughs> yeah, because it's although it's true that desire is the cause of for suffering, you have to be very careful that you don't say the cause of suffering is desire and just walk away. You have to have that person there to understand what it is you mean. And why is that? Because the word chanda, the, the Pali word chanda is not only a negative word. It is a wholesome word in this paragraph about this and an unwholesome word in this paragraph over here about something else. It's a neutral word. That it's, I don't think they call it like a neutral word and the subject matter that surrounds it decides if this is a bad thing or a good thing. So what do I mean? Well, you know, if you're a lay person, you get married, you, want, you desire to have a good marriage? Do you desire to have a good job? Do you desire to do well in school and have high grades? Do you desire to have a happy family? These are good desires for the lay community to be living their life. That's not a problem, okay? It's only when you go into um, clinging beyond, uh, you know, just general desire and you hold on to it and it takes over your life. That's where suffering happens, you see. So you have to be careful. You can't say that new statement is um, is dangerous because the third statement they changed the third one the third one is there is cessation of suffering well that's what we're working towards we're working on discovering how the cessation of the suffering can be uh reached and how quickly we can let go of the suffering and change it so that it's not causing us problems in life that's what we're trying to do 
But if I say to you, there is the that 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 the cessation of suffering is only reached when you desire absolutely nothing. Oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. Now we have negated, we have canceled out the neutral word and said we have to get rid of the word desire completely and look at what we have let go of completely. And also when you have teenagers involved, which by the way, Buddhism doesn't have a lot of teenagers right now across the world, just really wanting to go into this. It has people of college level investigating it, whether they stay or not is how it all works in relationship to their life or not. That's what's going on in this particular time on the history line. But young people, 13 to 15 years old who come in and hear you say that the cessation of suffering can only happen if you desire absolutely nothing. They, they just left the temple. You didn't see them go. They ran out and they just left. You can't, you can't say that to people because it isn't true totally, you see? So you have to refine what you're saying. You can't just say. So these are the safe ones. Is there is a suffering. There is a cause of suffering. There is a cessation of suffering. There is a path to the cessation of suffering. Okay, that comes out of all this on the other end. So that that's where we have to be really careful. We don't tamper, tamper with these baseline English statements that are open-ended. We shouldn't change them. We should work with them the way they've been accepted for so long and don't fool around with something that actually was working pretty well, you know? So that's the first thought about that. Okay, um, now, let me see. Here we have the final words concerning what will be his words taught in the future and what will not be his teaching and how to work this out. How are we supposed to know if someone shows up like me or anybody else teaching you something uh, in the future after he's gone? This is a discussion that was going on for him while he was sick and while he, he knew he was dying. And they're discussing this. And basically, he's very firm about this. He's bas basically saying that you need to... Um, compare whatever someone's saying, you should be respectful, you want to listen to them, you listen to them, give Dhamma talks, you try what they say, if it works, use it and supports you. If it doesn't work, let go of it. Don't feel obligated because the group is all trying to make something work, but it's not progressing, you know? So was the one statement the Buddha made I thought was really good when Ananda went to him once and said, Lord, is there good and bad meditation? Or And now remember, when I say good and bad, I'm not being hypercritical here. What I'm saying, uh, what I'm saying is, is there meditation, the way the Buddha looks at it, it operates well, or it doesn't operate. That's how the Buddha was examining what he was teaching all the time. You have to keep this in mind. So if I say something, I'm always looking for what is operating well for you or what is not operating well for you and why, how, what's going on. That's what's the most important thing. He just turned to him and he said, if a, if a meditation takes you to path and helps you to go down easily to reach the cessation and experience Nibbana, it's a good meditation. And it's not if it doesn't help you go smoothly to the path and get and have the path knowledge occur and then start going down the path so he was speaking operationally that's what we have to keep in mind you look at D Dignikaya, um the maha paranibbana sutta sections 4.7 to 4.11 in maurice walsh's um translation and you'll find what i'm talking about so this just talks to you about some of the stuff. Okay, I need to keep going to dependent origination is the next topic. If you're not learning dependent origination, you could take forever to figure out the origination, the disappearance, the personal involvement or gratification, the danger and the escape of all phenomena. And one thing he's explaining to you, not just in Chachaka, there are other sutras that support this and repeat it, you know, uh, that if you learn those 
pieces, you're ready to go into cessation and you're going to be able to experience Nibbana. So dependent origination reveals the suffering in life and how it does it, it reveals how you experience your life in this existence, step by step. We say phenomenally, phenomenologically, how do you do it? One phenomena at a time. And I can't, I don't want you to have to go to one phenomena. <laughs> I want you to go to one event of getting angry with somebody, frustrated in a situation, irritable, uh, you know, something like that, or falling into depression and having it overcome you or agoraphobia and things like that. And then, and then how is all this working and how can this stuff help you? And the way that this helps you is that this what dependent origination reveals to you how everything is operating. It teaches you the same human cognition being studied today in neurocognitive science. And cognitive psychology, they're looking at how the mind works step by step through an event. So what is this in relationship to uh, behavior modification therapy in certain types of psychology, which is healthy because it helps you look at one event with another person at a time? And how did the event work for you and for the other person as it was happening? And looking at just that doesn't say to you, you have to go back to a childhood and then come through your whole childhood to this place in the present time or um, just get wrapped up in the future and what might happen in frontward or backward. It says, it says, let's look at what happened yesterday between you and the other person when, in that situation in the office or whatever happened. Let's see if you can tell me what happened from the beginning. And then we look at how it works. And that's what the Buddha was doing 2,600 years ago. And this is very exciting. Because as we learn this, we watch how suffering ha actually occurs. We learn how, about perception, feeling, and consciousness, and how thoughts and feelings alone are not suffering. We watch how life events unfold frame by frame in a movie, like a movie, each frame. And once we learn to watch how suffering occurs, much of the fear and the doubt we suffer with falls away and the suffering is greatly reduced right there because you see how it happened. You know, why is that so important? Well, can you let go of suffering if I don't tell you what it is? And if I don't show you how to identify it when it's beginning to happen, how can you let go of it? I can't. So I had to have somebody tell me, what are the symptoms? You see, um, the meditation shows us how to practice right effort, which is the crit critically important fold of the eightfold path. The, the three folds at the bottom of the eightfold path, six, seven, and eight are the, uh, you know, right effort. And then your, um, let's see, right effort. And then your mindfulness, okay? and your concentration. Those are the components of your practice of meditation, see? So if we go into this a little bit, the way they structured it, um, you had the morality pieces of the Eightfold Path are at the bottom. If you were to draw like, you know, draw a line like this, okay, like a, a pyramid, at the bottom, the first three would be there. And then I think that, you know, okay. Then the middle one, the middle part of your pyramid would be these three, your right effort and your degree of concentration. What do I mean by degree of concentration? You're not supposed to concentrate hard. There is no absorption meditation talked about in the text itself. You see, nobody said do it really hard, work hard. What he's emphasizing is you have to be able to see and watch something in order to become wise. Knowledge and vision happened before knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge and vision means knowing by seeing something. Before you can build your house, you have to have a foundation block. That's it. His is knowledge and vision. 
And the other philosophers at that time would come and say to you a fact, the guru, and then you just leave and think about it. No questions, please. <laughs> you see? Okay? But in the Buddha comes along, he really changed the way all of this was searching for how to open the mind. Because one thing he said is you have to keep asking questions. You can't gain knowledge unless you ask, 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 ask in the, the knowledge as you're going along. Then he said, you have to see it if you're working in my meditation school. He says to these monks in one situation, I told you to learn it by seeing it. Direct knowledge is knowing it by seeing it. Those two are the same sort of direct knowledge and knowledge and vision. Then knowledge and wisdom starts to grow. That's how this was working. So the actual things that are talking about how to do something are in the middle. And then the top of the pyramid is getting to the, um, the wisdom and reaching cessation and going out from there into life with a brain, a mind that is not burdened by the weight of the past and the fear of the future. Could it be that lay people learned how to practice this way in the time of the Buddha? We need to be asking these questions. And did they reduce daily suffering by practicing the instructions the Buddha left? I believe they did. And I just taught some people the last 10 days, I taught some people who are just really regular folks and life. And this really changed how they see everything now with their perspective how they're going to approach things. Let's see now what happens to them in the next four weeks. Each of us has to test and decide for ourselves if anything I'm saying is true. Don't believe me, just go. I'm just talking about ways to test it. So the, third, the next piece of the information the person has to be exposed to while they're in training. 37 requisites of awakening, and we're not going to go into these. I would go into these if we do some more talks about this. And if you want to do more about it, we go into each section. There are seven interrelated groups of knowledge that create a support system for your meditation. And they are causally related. As you get to using these, you'll see the, the causal structure of it as you start to play with it. They arise at different stages in your development as you're growing your practice, and you will meet and greet them first and then get to know them better. Just the way if somebody moved in next door to you, you might say hi over the wall, how you doing, where are you from? You might have coffee with them then. You might hang out and help them with something in the yard or something later maybe have a barbecue, and then get to know them as friends in life. But you don't get to know them just like that when they move in next door. You just meet and greet them. Then you spend more time to get to know them. As you observe the intertwining nature of these pieces, your meditation goes deeper and deeper. And they are part of what I like to call the original Dhamma cloth. They're part of the threads that are in the weaving of the Dhamma cloth. In outline form, these groups, they make up 37 requisites, but they're represented here in the order that they usually arise. Most people, when you put these, you look in books, you'll find them 4445578. I put them here because this is the way they actually happen. Four foundations of mindfulness, four bases of spiritual power, five faculties, the balancing of the five parts of the five faculties, and then four steps of right effort gets really ingrained in your practice. Then the faculties turn into powers, and that's where they become automatically balancing themselves. That's why it's in there and repeated. For seven factors of awakening, they come into perfect balance for you to be able to fall into cessation. Then the Eightfold Path is a, creates a support system that, that's consisting of morality, wisdom, and observation. And the folds of the path are, work like this. Now, I didn't, I guess, I, did I put the old one and the new one here? I'm not sure. I guess I did. Well, we say harmonious because we're looking for harmony. Uh, some people will say effective 
for each piece. If there's not an effective amount, doesn't help and support the other pieces. But this is, these are the pieces of the Eightfold Path, and we're not going to teach this tonight, but we can do, do it uh, in another day. So this is actually, that's, that's what the pieces are uh, up to that point. Now, then what we did was we gave you this inside your workbook so you understood you could reflect on what we're teaching you. When we're teaching you a retreat, this one goes into show, looking at what precisely are all the parts that we teach you in a retreat. And we're not drowning you either. We're showing you how each one hooks into the next one, hooks into the next one, and how these things work and support each other. So this is all framed up like this, okay? And if we have some talks for the teachers, I want to throw open the floor now to... Um, to some questions. Anybody has any questions, pop up and, you know, ask me now. And if you think this is worthwhile going in this direction, I would like to try to flood the internet with an invitation to come and see how we're teaching and why we're teaching this way. And how, why is it working? Because it's supported uh, from the suttas itself, uh, explaining to you why it is working or how it interlocks and works with each part. How does that work to support your meditation? Questions, anybody? I have a question. Go ahead, you. Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Sister Kim. That's really helpful. Um, and if possible, I'd, I'd really appreciate a copy of that document because I think that's a, a lovely summary of, uh, uh, of the approach. And one of the things that I find um, uh, is the, when I'm teaching, is people are very interested in how this is going to help them in their daily life. Um, there's less uh, emphasis for them as individuals about uh, the idea of any sort of transcendent path. Um, so I've got uh, two or three people who are interested in that, and I've got a, a much more of the people who are interested in things which will uh, make their life better, take away um, some of the unnecessary um, uh, um, discomfort that they feel, which mm. they certainly now begin to appreciate, uh, comes from themselves rather than the circumstances they're in. Sure. Um, uh, and uh, so, some of the, some of the things that I find uh, a little constraining when I'm teaching is that uh, I'd like to say more about uh, the transcendent nature, um, but there's a limited appetite appetite for that um, i think can i jump uh, in here for just a second when you say the transcendent one before it slips away go away from transcending transcendence and transformation so much in go back to uh, bike riding good example <laughs> go back to bike riding and wouldn't it be fun for you to be able to go from a three-speed bike to a 10-speed bike and go on longer bike rides and enjoy yourself and all of all of the stuff that um, you know, the that's one of the things I liked about uh, Delson using the word effective. Now he says he wants to come back to harmonious, but effective was <laughs> how effective is this? How effective is this in your life? Um, what what's happening is like the woman that I was teaching, the one woman who I was teaching in this class, uh, this last ten days, you know, and she. She just was really flabbergasted, you know, at how it opened her mind. It opens the way she sees the world much clearer with much less weight on top of her. Go back to these aspects, oh, okay. lifting the weight off mm -hmm. you. You go to the Bhattacharata Sutta before you start teaching this stuff and take them through yeah. the, the lifeline and show them, play with them, ask them to tell you what the past means. You can feed them one yeah, or two. Yeah words like it's over but what else about it you're a little kid and this is my first yep. spelling word and tell me what past means tell me what future means and then yeah, yeah. then yeah. you look at the present and you say and another thing i always do that when i do that little game with the kid the spelling thing in the kids i also use the um analogy of everybody's walking around tomorrow when you look look real close maybe you can see their backpack They're all carrying a backpack full of the past on their back. 
And if you look again, they're not fat. They have a front pack. And the front pack Mm -hmm. is the worry, the day pack you carry for day hikes. You know, the little pack, that's right here. You thought it was their belly. No, it's the front pack. And they're worried about what might happen in the future right now. So what happens, Mm -hmm. what would happen to you if you came home after work and you, when you took your coat off, you took your backpack off and put it on the coat hook. And then you took Mm -hmm. your day pack off and you put it down below the, where you hang your coat. And then you went into the house and spent the evening with your family. What would happen to you? You Yeah. Yeah. I I, I agree with this. And, uh, and this is an aspect that uh, I I described to them. Um, um, And then when they're working with the uh, loving kindness meditation or the forgiveness meditation, um, what I notice is that uh, um, th- there's a sort of there's a contentment with um, uh, the uh, the pleasantness of the experience. It's a it's a respite. It's a it's a change. It gives them a sense of balance. Um, there's uh, um, it feels supportive uh, and these things. Um, and then there's, if you like, an attachment to uh, that feeling, that aspect of them. Okay, um, now, when they have an attachment to their feeling, you got to really yeah. want out, okay? But the thing is, they have to understand. You, I Honestly, I think I have to tell people 50 times during a retreat or 50 or 100 times during a Dhamma talk, sometimes I, I harp and harp and harp. You know, there were no retreats in the time of the Buddha. There were no mm. retreats. But we live in a time where we're all addicted to believing when we have this good feeling coming from our meditation, we're in retreat. Now, how do we take this home and apply it? Even even in this retreat, there was one person at the end of 10 days, and he was really keeping up with everything. And I thought it was really great, but he managed to ask the question at the end. Okay, now we've learned about this. Now, how do we apply it into life? He couldn't just transfer it. If we have been so indoctrinated that meditation is something you go to a retreat for and you must be in retreat to experience these good feelings and everything. So let's go away more. That's not what it's for. You should be mm. teaching them that it's to ride the bike and to have fun yeah. going on trips in life and using it all yes. the time. And we have to, yes. We have, all of us have to remember we don't just tell it to them. <laughs> we have to harp on it until one day they say, I was in the car the other day and I was in a traffic jam. And wow, I was laughing and sending meta to everybody. And all of a sudden they crossed this line, you know, they crossed the line. <laughs> okay. Or somebody fell down in the street the other day. And in India, that can be rough. You know, an old woman tries to cross the street in Indian traffic. Ah! just watching it is frightening and some man ran out there and got her in the middle of the road and got her to the other side and he said just seeing that person do that made me see oh wow he just acted with compassion and loving kindness and stopped what he was doing in his shop and ran out there and got him her and got her to the other side of the street see Mm -hmm. so little Mm -hmm. things happen people will come running to you and they'll start telling you this does work it comes it affects me you know in I, get, life. I, I get yeah I get I get that feedback and and one of the things that I describe is that this is meditation for daily life um and uh, uh, uh and I I suppose that what I'm describing is um the uh there isn't there isn't if you like um uh um, hmm, how to put it, uh, an appetite for, um, to explore this deeper. Uh, there, there's certainly an appetite for um, uh, the, to, to make uh, the experience in life easier and more comfortable and uh, more expansive. Um, and I'm just being, if you like, patient with that process and allowing them to, allowing that to, um expand into yeah, that one thing uh, I, I guess i would caution you one thing is i would caution you not to let them uh trick you into thinking well how do i put this <laughs> um i don't know we 
you know, you're teaching it as a lay person, you're teaching it and you're teaching it in a community. Mm. It's probably a lot of Christian, you know, and the, so, but this, when I taught it to the, to the nuns, the way I approached it was, this is a, um, an examination of your mind. It's taking you to the heart of mm. Buddhism. How does everything work for the human being? It's, it's you know, it's a, I'm sorry. I don't want to upset any monks or anybody, but it's a totally accidental thing. This is a religion. Totally accidental. Uh, I, I understand had, what you're saying there. Yeah. If this had been a science institute at the corner, Ananda would have taken every di- everything down that he learned and not waited for a conference and turned it into the science institute or the psychology institute. It just wasn't there. Mm. That's all. No. And the only way to, you know, for it to be preserved was for the monks to keep teaching it. And it was making people have such better lives. It changed mm-hmm. the um, uh, the lending system in marketing and marketing and kings and military and agreements and all kinds of uh, things that you wouldn't expect it changed. And if you go back and start to look, how was it before he did this stuff? And, and how did it change at that time when the golden age was there? What was actually happening? Everything was so much nicer. Yeah. So <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but um, I guess I would sit and maybe think about different ways of saying what this is. And it, it is a, mm-hmm. uh, it's a study in human, uh, it is a study in human cognition and how your mind works and how disturbances in the mind and body operate that the Buddha figured out. And now we're just beginning to reclaim them in some medical circles too, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Good. What else did you have with? Good. Thank you. Yeah, with what else did you have as a as a when you were teaching that you ran into? Um, uh, there's a there's a real there's a real reflex um, to uh, when when the mind gets uh, uncomfortable uh, to go back to a breath to settle and to encourage or discouraging that and saying no just work with the four R- or the six hours and the the four efforts um and and not to not to need the mind to be calm in the way that they're perhaps e- expecting but simply work with the uh six hours whenever you're being drawn away okay um, are they, are they- I- you, the people that you're working with like that, are they coming from a breathing meditation before and now they're coming to you? They're largely coming from a yoga background. So there's a lot of emphasis on. Okay. On so in yoga background, you know, the breathing is, is, is um, paid attention to an awful lot in the position yeah, yeah. that you're dealing with, you see. And when you're doing your sets and everything, you're doing that, but you have to re- have them remember that, the benefit of what you're really trying to teach them, if you're teaching Brahma Viharas, if you are, you keep mm-hmm. going back to that chart and showing them loving yeah. kindness and uh, the metta karuna mudita upeka. And what you're canceling out here naturally inside your system is if you are mm-hmm. just building, when you're restless, you build up your loving kindness, you're canceling out any thoughts of ill will. They can't function inside mm. you if you're working with yep. The meta, and if you go back to your breath, you're not working with meta. So don't expect to exactly. expand yeah. and get stronger and get automatic because breath is not where you should be going to. You should be going to the right effort and coming back and staying with the development of the meta and let, allowing it to change into the karuna, the softer version. Let me ask you this: When you had students, did they get a little bit upset um, that um, how do I put it? Um, that when the meta felt strong and they felt like they had the meta, there's this, there is this sort of false thing we, we see happening. I've got to get the meta really strong. I've got to keep it strong, okay? It's not true. Why is it not true? Why am yeah. I saying that? Well, if you're practicing meta and you get the meta working with the spiritual friend, 
it drops off in power and softens as it's moving up into the head and becoming Karuna. So with Karuna, it doesn't need a lot of power. And actually, there is this mm-hmm. false thing from trying too hard to concentrate on breath in ways that um, are not outlined in the instructions for breath. There's nothing in the instructions. I was teaching a class a couple of weeks ago. There's nothing in the instructions themselves that say, concentrate on the breath, being long, short, hard, soft, etc., and so forth, short, that sort of thing. That's not what the instructions are saying. And so people are emphasizing this. And when we get in that, that we have a habit as if we were doing something in another practice, doing it over and over again, it's in here. And it is one of your neural pathway strands. And you need to, you're not going to eliminate the strand, but you're, you can just tell your brain, I'm not doing breath right now. I'm doing metta. I want to discover what doing pure metta is. So we, mm, when we're yeah. teaching Bhante and I, uh, I follow what he's doing. And when he's doing in his interviews, he's not accepting you to go back to that breath. Don't go back to that breath. Mm. Find out mm. what, discover what pure metta is and what it's like when it changes into Karuna. That's what mm, and the yeah. rest, the rest, the rest is like the evolution of the butterfly. Do you remember I did the evolution of the butterfly it was like the egg under the leaf and it turned into the worm and the worm is very energetic about eating everything <laughs> and it gets to be this fat worm. Then it goes into the chrysalis and there's a joy that's going on inside you internally inside this chrysalis. And then you come out as the butterfly and it's totally confident. I can just come out, stretch my wings, get all the wet stuff off and fly away with total equanimity. See? So mm-hmm. this is this evolution of the uh, of the uh, the butterfly. That one evolution about the butterfly. And another way to look at it is, you know, you can tell people this too. This is really good. All human beings are born with seeds that are internally inside of them. This is not from some past life secret thing. It's just part of the structure of the human being. Children are in touch with these seeds, but they don't get them to fully bloom because they're corrected so much as they're growing up. They don't have the freedom to let them bloom all the way. So when you come to the Brahma Viharas, you might think about the four seeds that are inside you that have never been cultivated correctly. And you want to find out how will they bloom and how will the blooming of the metta flower or the karuna flower, the mudita flower, the equanimity flowers, how will that affect me internally if I allow this garden to bloom? In order to do that, you cannot bring in other fertilizer from anything else you ever learned. You have to go and look and work with these seeds individually. And we're trying to show you how to allow them to bloom, allow them to wake up. Now, the four pieces are causally related. When the uh, metta is taught properly and they practice it, you know, as something, we don't stop them and say, now we're going to work with Karuna. We wait until this happens naturally when it moves up in their head, and don't we? And, and we... And we watch how they just relax into it and allow it. And then it's going to be quieter and it's going to be softer, like cotton, you see? And then we watch that go into a kind of joy that's working inside the whole body internally that's different from PT in the beginning, from the uplifting joy. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you play with them with these similes and see what happens. I think the English would bite on these. I think they would like them. It's like the sonnets of uh, who are those early poets that the English had a lot of early poetry, you know, that they were in the poetry stage in the 1800s. And Mm -hmm. those poetries, things just flow out. You have that inside you. You might not write the poetry, but if you practice this the right way, this is how it works. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for helping. That's great. Anybody else have a question about anything, huh? Okay, I think probably if there's no questions, I think it's time for me to crash again. (laughs) 
I have these, um, this uh, time I have to take care of just resting a lot for a little while and seeing if this uh, wonderful adventure of cracking a rib, <laughs> if it, it can heal in about three weeks time or so. I, I'm challenging myself, I think it can. So I let's say a prayer as we go to the end, okay? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, the devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.